have to tell you, uh, a week ago on a Thursday morning, the Lord gave me the word for 2016 for our church. And uh, it's so good, I can't wait till New Year's to get here. Uh, good things are coming to Harvest Time. Good things are coming to our church. Sorry, I didn't do that in the first three services, so you got me all verklempt. All right, look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to begin reading in verse 7, and we're going to talk about the measure of our ministry. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 7. Paul says, you are judging by appearances. If anyone is confident they belong to Christ, they should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as they do. So even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave us for building up rather than tearing down, I will not be ashamed of it. Look at verse 12 if you would. We do not dare classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. We met who met when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but will confine our boasting to the sphere of service that God himself has measured to us, a sphere that also includes you. We're not going too far in our boasting, as would be the case if we had not come to you, for we did, not, for we did get as far with, as you with the gospel of Christ. Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of work done by others. Our hope is that your faith continues to grow so that our sphere of activity among you will greatly expand so that we can go preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. For we do not want to boast about work already done in someone else's territory, but let the one who boasts yes. boast in the Lord. Yes. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commands. All right, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to just speak to us. Father, thanks for this morning. Thank you for your presence here. Lord, we thank you for your powerful word and the people you love so much. I pray, Father, that we would encounter you through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, just say amen, amen. and amen. amen. How do you measure a ministry? How do you measure the spiritual effectiveness of a local church? How do you measure the eternal impact of a fellowship of believers on earth? In just a few moments, we're going to take a walk together down into the foundation of phase two. I know you believe in miracles, so you better pray because I'm going to try and preach short this morning so that we can go take a walk together. And we're going to go plant these tubes with scriptures in them and prayer requests and promises. Did you come? Did you bring your tube this morning? Have you got it? If you didn't receive one of these and you want to participate, we have more of these in the back and at the end of the service you can take one. But we're putting down scriptures. We're putting down hopes. We're putting down prayer requests for our family and our church and blessings in these things. And I hope as you look around, you'll feel inspired by the enormous scope of this project. Phase two is 190 feet wide at its widest point. It's 170 feet long. There is a 120 foot center aisle for the bride to walk down. The basement level is 15 feet, six inches high. These foundation walls, if you've been watching them and wondering, the foundation walls are 16 feet high. The main level is 46 feet and 10 inches high. This ceiling is 20 feet. The ceiling in the new sanctuary is 46 feet and 10 inches for an overall height of 61 feet and seven inches. The floor area of phase two is 36,000 square feet. The volume of phase two, that's the amount of space inside the four walls, is 1,840,000 cubic feet. Phase one and phase two together have 61,000 square feet. When you go down into the foundation, you're gonna be walking on top of three million pounds of gravel that we've put down. <laughs> on top of that, we are pouring 800,000, I'm sorry, 8 million pounds of concrete. And on top of that, we're going to erect 700,000 pounds of steel. The occupancy of the phase two sanctuary will be 1,000 souls. Amen. The total occupancy of phase one and phase two together 
will be 2,200 people that this building has the capacity of holding at one time. And when the parking lots are finished, there'll be 360 spaces. So if you're one of those lovely saints who likes to park sideways across two spaces, you can do that all the way at the end of the parking lot out there. <laughs> it's very easy to measure a church building, but how do you measure a church's ministry? Paul addresses that question in 2 Corinthians 10. Looking at his words, I find four truths about measuring our ministry, and I want to share them with you quickly. Me uh, four truths about measuring our ministry. The first truth is this. God has given us all a measure of ministry. The entire letter of 2 Corinthians is Paul's defense of his apostolic ministry. Paul spent 18 months in Corinth evangelizing the city and founding the church there. And after he left to go check up on some of his other churches, some troublemakers showed up right on his heels, traveling preachers from Jerusalem who wanted to usurp Paul's authority and steal the affections and the offerings of the Corinthians. And the way they went about usurping Paul's authority was to measure themselves against Paul. They came with glowing letters of reference from Jerusalem. Paul had come with none. They were charismatic and eloquent, but Paul was hard on the eyes and he was plain spoken. They were very authoritative in their presentation, but Paul was mild-mannered. Their ministry was amply supported with offerings, but Paul supported himself by selling tents. They were healthy and prospering and problem-free, but Paul was sickly and always in some kind of trouble. In 2 Corinthians 10, Paul makes a play on words using the word measure. He says that the things that the troublemakers measure are not at all what God measures. They were measuring superficial, earthly things, but God measures character, love, humility, integrity, faithfulness, Christ-likeness. And listen, God measures what we've done and how far we've gone with the measure of ministry that he's entrusted to us. In verses 11 and 12, Paul says, I wouldn't dare compare myself with those who measure their great performance. No, I simply delight in fulfilling the measure of ministry that God has apportioned to me. Beloved, each one of us has received a measure of ministry. To each one of us who is in Christ, God has entrusted a unique ministry. God has assigned to you a specific ministry. God has apportioned to you a predetermined ministry. Pastor Tommy Reed talked about it last week. For by grace we have been saved through faith. And this is not from ourselves. It is the gift of God. So that there's no room for boasting here. For we are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Which, what does it say? God prepared in advance for us to do. Before the foundation of the world was laid, God apportioned a measure of ministry to you. Something specific, something unique for you to do in the world that only you can do while you were still just a twinkle in your daddy's eye. God apportioned a measure of ministry to you, an impact for you to make in his world, a blessing for you to bring before you drew your first breath. God apportioned a measure of ministry to you before you even received God's gift of saving faith and grace. God apportioned a measure of ministry to you. Amen. What is your measure? Well, I like to say it this way. That's for God to know and for you to find out. Amen. And we're here to help with that. To Paul, God apportioned a very big measure of ministry. God assigned him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. 
the refiner and the defender of the gospel, the author of one-third of the New Testament. Not all of us are called to be apostles like Paul, but all we who belong to Christ have been apportioned a measure of ministry just the same. And Jesus said that our measures are all different. My measure of ministry is to be a pastor and a teacher here at Harvest Time Church. Our friend Raymond Mui in Malaysia, his measure of ministry is to be an evangelist to closed countries in Southeast Asia. Our friend David Wagner from Pensacola, his measure of ministry is to be a prophet. And you have a measure of ministry too. God has apportioned leadership to some and administration to others, yeah. and helping ministries to others, and serving ministries to others, and hospitality to others, and counseling to others, and intercessory prayer to others, and the ministry of giving and funding the work of God to others, and compassion ministries to others. Yeah. What is your measure? Well, that's for God to know. And for you to find out, and we're here to help with that. Amen. Beloved, listen, when it comes to the end of your life and you stand before God, the measure of your life will really come down to two questions. Number one, did you belong to Christ? And second, did you go the full distance in the ministry that he measured out to you? How much did you accomplish of what God laid out for you to do? How far did you get? Many of us can answer that first question confidently. Yes, we belong to Christ. But we mustn't overlook that second question. Paul said, I don't dare compare myself with those who measure showmanship. I'm not nearly so good a performer as they. No, I'm simply focused on going the full distance in the ministry that God has measured out for me. To the Philippians, Paul said, I press to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. I press on towards the goal to win the prize of his calling. At the end of his life, writing from a prison cell for the very last time, Paul was able to say that he had indeed gone the distance. He wrote these words, I fought the good fight. I have finished my course. You know, God's commendation of Moses was that Moses went the full distance of the ministry that had been measured out for him. God said about Moses, he is faithful in all my house. He has not left undone anything that I told him to do. That was also God's commendation of Joshua. Joshua didn't leave undone anything that God had measured out for him. That was what was prophesied of Jesus, of Yeshua, thousands of years before he came to the unfaithful priest Eli. God said, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do everything that is in my heart and in my mind. Yes. When Jesus came, he said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me and how many of you know what it says? And to finish his work. When Jesus died on the cross, he cried out, it is finished because he had completed the measure of ministry that God had apportioned to him. Hebrews affirms that when it says Jesus was a faithful high priest to the one who appointed him just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Pointing to Jesus, Hebrews says to us then, let us lay aside every weight and every entangling sin and run with patience the race that has been measured out for us, looking to Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. There's kind of a catchy song out right now by One Republic. It's called, I Did It All. Do you know that song? I like it. It talks about being able to say at the end of your life that you lived to the fullest, that you loved without reserve, that you saw as much of the world as you could see, that you did as much as you could do. It's a fun song. But you know, for we who belong to Christ, I did it all, takes on a whole different meaning. It means that on that day when we go to stand before him, we can say like Moses, we can say like Joshua, we can say like Jesus and Paul, it is finished. I did everything that my father measured out for me to do.
Four truths about measuring our ministry. First of all, God has given us all a measure of ministry. And second, God has given us all a sphere of ministry. In verse 13, Paul says God not only gave him a measure, but God also appointed him a sphere in which to do that ministry. We, however, Paul says, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere that God has measured to us, a sphere which includes you. The measure of your ministry is what you are called to do. The sphere of your ministry is where or to whom you are called to do it. Paul's sphere of ministry was threefold. It was ethnic, it was geographic, and it was spiritual. Paul was assigned to reach unbelievers who were primarily non-Jewish by birth who lived outside of Israel. Jesus himself assigned that sphere of ministry to Paul on the Damascus Road. And that assignment was affirmed by the Jerusalem apostles, by Peter and James and John. They agreed, yes, Paul, we are apostles to the Jewish world. And God has assigned to you to be an apostle to the Gentile world. The troublemakers who had come from Jerusalem to Corinth had no right to be there at all. They were trespassing on Paul's sphere. Beloved, God has apportioned to you a measure of ministry, and he has also assigned to you a sphere in which to do it. Your sphere may be geographical. It may be a particular place. Maybe your neighborhood, maybe your town, it may be your county, it may be your state. Our sphere here at Harvest Time is specifically Greenwich and Fairfield County and Westchester County, these suburbs of New York. Your sphere might be a whole country, it might be a continent. Paul's sphere extended from Syria all the way to Spain. Your sphere might be a specific people group. Maybe your sphere is the financially disadvantaged. Or maybe it's the up and outers. Maybe your sphere is youth. Maybe your sphere is the addicted or the abused or the abandoned. I'll tell you, God needs to raise up someone to minister in the sphere of lesbians and gays and bisexuals and transgender people. You see, Jesus is so longing to bestow upon them the inheritance of his own shalom, his own wholeness of personhood, so that there is nothing missing and nothing broken in their lives. God needs to raise up someone else Else to minister in the sphere of Muslims in America, uh, uh, an exploding population, not only through immigration, but through people converting to Islam. God needs a man and a woman in that sphere. One of our friends in ministry reaches out to students in the elite prep schools here in Fairfield County and Westchester County. That is his sphere. One of our classmates from seminary graduated and went to Lowell, Massachusetts, planted a church there, and the church filled up entirely with immigrants from the country of Laos. That was his sphere. What is your measure of ministry and what is your sphere? Let me share three quick truths about your sphere. First of all, your sphere begins right here. Jesus knew that his disciples' sphere would extend all the way to the ends of the earth, the, the earth but he told them, begin in Jerusalem. Paul was in Damascus when Jesus called him. And although Paul's sphere would extend all the way to Spain, Paul began his ministry in Damascus. In the same way, the first place that your ministry will manifest is where you are right now. This is your sphere. Your home is your sphere. Your family is your sphere. Your husband is your sphere. Your wife is your sphere. Your children are your sphere. God bless their little hearts. Your grandkids are your sphere. Your neighborhood is your sphere. Your workplace is your sphere. Your circle of friends is your sphere. Harvest Time Church is your sphere. I don't care how you got here. God knew before the foundation of the world that right now you would be here and God intends for your sphere to begin here. This is your Jerusalem. The second truth about your sphere is that your sphere may not stay here. Your sphere might not only be here. 
And it might not always be here. At the time that Paul wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Corinth was as far west as he had traveled, but it wasn't the end of his sphere. He says to the Corinthians, well, we've made it as far as you with the gospel, but we still have a little further to go in our sphere. Harvest Time Church is my family's God-given sphere. God called us here in the spring of 1996 through the voice of one of our seminary professors. God affirmed that call through Pastor Tate and through our district superintendent and through our board of deacons and trustees and through our congregation. Denise and I have a God-given right to be here that has been affirmed by godly men and by God's people. But you know, my sphere isn't only here anymore. My sphere has extended to Malaysia. It's extended to Indonesia. It's extended to Myanmar. They're all asking, when can I come back? My sphere has extended to a group of young pastors who look to me for prayer and for counsel and for guidance. My sphere has extended to an audience around the world listening via the internet. I was amazed. This last Tuesday, I found out that in the last 30 days, people from 71 different countries around the world have watched sermons on our YouTube channel from Harvest Time Church. That amazed me. And it might be true for you too. Your sphere begins here, but it might not be limited to here. And it might extend outward from here. And it might not always be here. God might move you on altogether to someplace else. And if he does it, I'll let you go holding onto your ankles all the way out the door. <laughs> Three truths about your sphere. Your sphere begins here. Your sphere might not stay here. But listen, third, God will not extend your sphere until your work is finished here. Amen. When Paul first arrived in Corinth, there was an explosive response to the gospel. More than anywhere in Macedonia, more than in Athens, people responded with an explosive response. And Paul thought it was time to move on. But God came to him in a vision one night and he said, don't leave. Your work isn't finished here. So Paul stayed for 18 more months. And five years later, Paul was still not free to move westward from Corinth. He writes in verse 15, Our hope is that your faith will continue to grow so that we can finally go. God wouldn't allow Paul to move on from Corinth until the relationships were stable and healed there. God wouldn't allow Paul to move on until all the loose ends were tied up. God wouldn't let Paul move on until Paul had completed the full measure of ministry that God had appointed to him in that church. And it's true for me and you too. God won't extend our sphere until our work is finished here. And if you've tried to move on, but the doors haven't opened and God hasn't let you, it's probably because there's a little bit more that you need to finish here. Four truths about measuring our ministry. God has given us all a measure. He's given us all a sphere. Now, here's my favorite part. The preaching about to get good now. Listen. <laughs> Within our sphere, God has given us all authority to pull down Satan and to build up people. Amen. Beloved, listen to me. This is your sphere. This is your Jerusalem. Your home is your sphere. Your family is your sphere. Where God has planted you is your sphere. And within your sphere, God has given you the spiritual authority to lead people to repentance and saving faith and to disciple them into fully functioning members of God's family. Amen. Let's talk about the authority to pull down Satan. Pastor Nick already talked to us from verses 1 through 6 about pulling down strongholds. Those strongholds, those towers Paul talks about, they are evil spirits that prevent people from embracing the gospel and surrendering their lives to Christ. And beloved, listen to me, within your sphere, within your home, within your family, within your circle of friends, within your neighborhood, within your town, within your region, wherever you are, God has given you the authority to pull down spirits of unbelief. 
He's given you authority to pull down religious spirits and rebellious spirits, spirits of fear, spirits of confusion, spirits of anxiety, spirits of depression, spirits of addiction, spirits of infirmity, unclean spirits, gluttonous spirits, spirits of poverty, all of the agents of the God of this world that blind the minds of unbelievers. As we proclaim the gospel, as we gently share the gospel, as we live the gospel in front of the people in our life, power from the Holy Spirit emanates out of us and it confronts those strongholds that hold people captive and it defeats them. Come on, that's good preaching right there. The disciples came back from a tour of ministry and they were rejoicing because the sick had been healed and people had been delivered from evil spirits. And Jesus said, yeah, I know already because from here I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And he said, see, I have given you authority to trample on serpents and on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. You have authority in your sphere. That's precisely what Jesus promised Paul on the Damascus Road, and it is precisely what happened when Paul arrived in Corinth. Jesus told Paul, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. I'm sending you to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, to turn them from the power of Satan to God, so that they might receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who belong to me. And when Paul arrived in Corinth, that is precisely what happened. Strongholds were pulled down. Yes. But even better than to pull down Satan, Within our sphere, God has given us the authority to build up people. Amen. Three times at the end of this letter, Paul says God has given him authority to build up. That word build up, it means to build a house. Paul uses that word all over his letters. How do we build people up into, the ha into a house? Let me give you a few things real quick to close. How do we build people up into a house? Well, for one thing, we lead people into becoming a dwelling place for God's holy presence. Earlier, Paul told the Corinthians, you are God's building. He identifies that building as God's temple. And he says specifically, it is the holy of holies of the Holy Spirit, the place where God's presence dwells. Beloved, within our sphere, God has given us the authority not only to pull down the evil spirits that hold people captive, but to lead people into the experience of the indwelling Holy Spirit. How do we build people up into a house? Another way is that we affirm people in God's love and in God's wholeness. Paul told the Corinthians, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. It's that same word, builds into a house. The troublemakers didn't love God's people at all. They loved themselves. Their heart was not to build up others. Their heart was to build up themselves into the beautiful house that Paul had started to construct in Corinth, they introduced an atmosphere of petty competitiveness, bragging and showing off, grasping for power, impressing some and intimidating others. Rather than a beautiful atmosphere of the spirit that edifies, they introduced a toxic atmosphere that pulls people down. You ever been in a toxic atmosphere? But Paul was all about edifying people. He was all about affirming people's infinite worth to God. Paul said from now on, he said Christ has come, he's changed our heart, and from now on we don't evaluate people all based on superficial measures. Now we see the infinite worth of each person to God. Paul was all about encouraging people to grow. He was all about modeling the kindness and patience of Christ the humility of Christ, the sacrificial service of Christ, doing whatever he could to make for other people's peace. He was about helping every person find a place that they belong in God's family, in God's house. How do we build people up into a house? Another way is that we strengthen people in faith, in the faith, 
and in faithfulness. Paul says our hope is that your faith will continue to grow so that our sphere of ministry among you will uh, continue to transform you. Beloved, within our sphere, God has given us the authority to help others grow in their faith, to increase the measure of their faith, to believe God more, to trust God more, to entrust themselves to God more, to surrender to Him more. Within our sphere, God has given us the authority to help people deepen their knowledge of God and their experience of God. Within our sphere, God has given us the authority to help people strengthen their commitment to God and in Increase in their obedience to God. How do we build people up into a house? So many more things I could say, but let me close with this one. Worship team, if you'd come help me. How do we build people up into a house? Listen, we organize people into an orderly household that has a lasting legacy. There are two things that building a house implies. Don't miss this. Listen. There are two things that building a house implies. Number one, building a house implies order and a reliable structure. Earlier, Paul said that God made him a wise master builder to lay a solid foundation for the future of the church, for the future of Christianity. In just a moment, we're going to take a walk together down into the foundation of phase two and everything that you're about to walk upon has been done meticulously to ensure a solid, reliable structure. You're about to walk on three million pounds of gravel, onto which we're in the process of pouring eight million pounds of concrete, onto which we're going to erect 700,000 pounds of steel. Phase two is built with order to ensure a reliable, solid structure. I just want to tell you something. If New York City ever starts to unravel, get yourself here to harvest time. Get yourself to the basement of this building. Uh, <laughs> the, architect, the architect who designed this building builds skyscrapers all over the world. And I want to tell you, phase one and phase two are built like the Rock of Gibraltar. So if anything ever happens, just get yourself here. I know heaven and earth will pass away, but I know that in the millennial kingdom, phase one and phase two will still be standing here on the earth. In the same way, God has given us authority to build an orderly household, to build an orderly family. Listen, your sphere, your home is your home, your family is your sphere. And God has given you authority from the Holy Spirit to build within your home an orderly family, an orderly household, so that there's a structure that will endure the tests and the trials of time. And that takes us to the second implication of building a house, which is a lasting legacy of sons and daughters. A household is a lineage of generations of sons and daughters who share in the wealthy inheritance of the family. And that's my prayer for Harvest Time Church. That's why we're going down in the foundation today to bury scriptures and to bury blessings and to bury prayer requests. It is to sow a seed in the spirit so that until Jesus comes again, there will always be a lasting legacy of sons and daughters here who are lovers of God and who are worshipers of his only son, Jesus truths about measuring our ministry. We've all been given a measure. We've all been given a sphere. A sphere. But we have all authority. And the last thing is this. When we walk in Christ's love and humility and integrity, God will commend us with good results. I want to leave you with a promise from Jesus. Jesus said to us, you did not pick me, but I picked you and I ordained you to bear fruit. That word ordained, it's very interesting. It means God strategically placed us. That's your sphere. Guess what? You didn't pick Jesus. Before the foundation of the world, he picked you. And he gave you a measure of ministry. And he gave you a sphere of ministry. He ordained you. And he gave you a promise that you will bear fruit. 
you will bear fruit, you will bear more fruit, you will bear much fruit, and you will bear fruit that remains. What is the measure of our ministry? Well, it is, and it isn't phase two. Not the width of phase two. It's not the length of phase two. It's not the height of phase two. It's not the beautiful architecture. But the measure of our ministry is the vibrant family of God that needs a building so large as phase two. The measure of our ministry is a family that has grown from six people on Christmas Eve 1983 to seven worship services meeting on three campuses every weekend. The measure of our ministry is a family of God where Satan's strongholds are pulled down and where people are built up. It's a family that is the holy of holies of the Holy Spirit. It's a family where people are built up in love and in faith. It's a family where people are encouraged to discover and pursue their own measure and sphere of ministry. As we walk down into the foundation of phase two together, let's not go to celebrate a mere building. Let's go celebrate what is the true measure of our ministry. Would you stand together? Would you give Jesus all the glory and all the honor and all the praise? Let's give him a great big praise in this place today.